Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, now we are on a leaf in uh, on YouTube. So, Bano, you can uh, yeah, sure. start. Okay, so you will start straight away. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, so welcome to the fourth Complex Fluids and Soft Matter Seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Modern Liu. So Modern has completed his PhD, uh, his bachelor thesis and master thesis in Beijing Normal University in 2015. Uh, where he has mainly focused on statistical physics. Uh, he then went to Karlsruhe to finish his PhD in 2020. Um, and since then, he works as a postdoc in Karlsruhe. Uh, actually, he worked at two different institutes. So first he worked at the Institute of Nanotechnology, and uh, then he went to the Institute of Functional Interfaces, where he is right now, I think. Um, so Modern is an expert on um, molecular dynamic simulations, metallic organic frameworks, and I think adaptive data analysis. And today he'll speak about uh, ionic liquids. Um, and more specifically, um, he will speak about, as the title of his talk says, terminal traffic jams in a supercapacitor regulating the vehicular transport of ionic liquids embedded in metal organic frameworks. So yeah, um, quite a challenging title. Um, so thanks a lot for being here today, Modan, and uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. So hey. stage is yours. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, now uh, uh, let's start. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening. So my name is Modan Viu. I will be, uh, 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 I mean, I'm very happy to be here in the CFSM seminar to present to you our serious works focusing on ionic liquids embedded in metal organic frameworks. That is the transport of these ionic liquids. Uh, they, they show unique uh, the transport features. So here's a, a, a brief outline of this talk. First, uh, let's talk about how we are interested, or I mean, why we are interested in these two components, the ionic liquids and metal organic frameworks. And why should we combine them? And then uh, there will be the uh, investigation of how these liquids will diffuse through the metal organic framework from uh, both the experiment perspective and uh, the perspective of molecular dynamic simulations. And then there will be three uh, different case studies uh, to investigate. Um, uh, what kind of uh, 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 sorry? What kind of uh, features will be there if we put an liquid in a certain morph called HS1? And uh, what if we introduce a mixture of the ion liquids by introducing lithium ions inside? And then, what about changing the morph to some other uh, morph than HS1? That is the UIO family morphs. And uh, so, uh, all these different case studies will. Uh, encounter this uh, so-called bunching and the mobilization of all these ion liquids. Then I'll draw an analogy of uh, the so-called uh, bunching to uh, what we uh, really experience daily, that is the traffic congestions on the roads. And then there'll be uh, a brief summary and uh, the acknowledgement. So um, our system, uh, is constituted from two components, as I already uh, suggested. There you have the ion liquids. Uh, ion liquids are a class of molten salt. Uh, there is a special class of it uh, that still remains in its, uh, uh, in its liquid phase at room temperature. So as you can see here in this uh, small picture here, this is ion liquids on the right hand side. This is uh, uh, the so-called BMIM, NTF2, or TFSI. This is uh, one of the these most common ion liquids that we use uh, in the simulations and uh, the experiments. Compared to other, uh, let's say, uh, evac electrolytes, they have specific uh, advantages. Uh, for instance, uh, compared to the uh, lithium-based batteries, uh, all these ion liquids, they are non-flammable. They have 
uh, negligible vapor pressure. And uh, when you heat them up, they don't basically explode. Uh, I mean, they don't explode. So this is more advantages than the uh, lithium ion batteries that you currently have. And uh, as you can see here, um, and the liquids are uh, made of uh, these cations, which carry positive charge and uh, uh, the negative uh, uh, charge carriers, that is the anions. And these uh, ions are presented as, let's say, a molecular uh, ions, so that uh, it is easy to uh, modify them. For instance, you can change the R groups here to, to make it larger or make it smaller. Thus, you can also uh, choose how the diffusion properties will be for these ion liquids. And uh, as you can see here, the uh, uh, number of choices is basically comb uh, combinatorial. So you have a lot of them. You have a lot of choices. On the metal organic framework side, uh, this is often referred to as uh, MOFs. And they are uh, nanoporous structures that uh, has a very well-defined crystalline structure. So uh, as you can see here in this uh, sketch, these ion liquids are composed of these uh, so-called uh, metal nodes shown in uh, blue, and these organic vinkers show as uh, these uh, uh, green segments. So these are like Lego blocks so that uh, you can choose whatever uh, metal node you wish and try to combine it to a, a, or attach it to another vinker. And uh, if you go with the so-called layer by layer deposition uh, method, you can actually synthesize a thin MOF film, say to the uh, thickness of 100 nanometers with all these uh, small pores inside, uh, well aligned and well defined. The uh, defect density can be very low and the, the uh, roughness of the surface can be very low. So in the end, you have a 3D uh, cage bike structure that uh, can, uh, Absorb, for instance, the gases like uh, H2 or CO2. Um, of course, when you select also different met metal nodes and the different organic vinkers, uh, the vinkers can be long or can be, uh, can be short. There you have the adjustable porosity for this nanoporous material. And they have a very large uh, specific surface area so that uh, they work very well at absorbing certain uh, gases. And uh, it is mostly used uh, for gas separation and gas storage. And uh, uh, the time picture will be looking like this one. You see, yes, uh, apparently all these crystalline structures are uh, clearly visible. And uh, to remind you that uh, these morphs, uh, for these morphs, you have uh, also a lot of uh, options how you synthesize them. Uh, up to now, I think there are seven. 100,000 different uh, options uh, in the uh, materials database, uh, sorry, materials, uh, materials research database from uh, in the US. There you uh, have uh, different porosity, uh, different absorbent isotherms. Then let's say uh, we wanted some electron, electronic device made from these two components. The idea is that uh, the MOF, even though it is uh, a well, very well-defined rigid structure, it doesn't conduct very well. Often you have to make decorations on the vinkers. For instance, uh, in this H plus one, the vinker is here. You may attach uh, additional functional groups uh, here to make it conduct. But uh, the other way of doing this uh, to make uh, it conduct electricity is to introduce all these uh, ion liquids inside of these morphs. So here, this is a typical pair of uh, cations and anions for the aliquids. If these things go inside, uh, you, what you have is a solid state electrolyte. Um, and uh, that is uh, the grain layer here. We, we put this uh, grain layer on top of the uh, interdigitated uh, gold substrate. Uh, that is uh, the gold electrodes you have here. Then uh, we apply uh, a, some voltage. All these 
um, moths will stay there, whereas the uh, ion liquids will just move inside. Uh, all these uh, the charge carriers will swim across the metal organic framework. Uh, that's uh, the overall system will be uh, conductive. To study this, of course, uh, molecular dynamics is arguably the best tool because here, what you have uh, for the conductivity is there are actually uh, displacements from these molecular ions. Then uh, we come to the specific case studies. The first one uh, will be uh, comparing the conductivity of the bulk phase on the liquids versus the on the liquids uh, embedded in the metal organic frameworks. You can imagine that you have a 3D empty box uh, filled with all these uh, small ions, uh, these are molecular ions. And when you apply uh, electric field, say uh, from left to the right, then these uh, cations will move in this direction, whereas the uh, anions will move in the opposite direction. Since all these ions have finite sizes, uh, it's easy for them to block the passage of each other. So uh, from the molecular dynamic simulations of this so-called bulk phase and liquids, on the cross-sectional area, you see the formation or the emergence of a so-called dissipative structure. That is, uh, all these ions will uh, spontaneously form these so-called dedicated ion channels. All these red ones carrying positive charges will be coming outside of the screen, whereas the blue ones will go inside of, uh, of the screen. So they avoid uh, hitting each other. But uh, it's easy to imagine that when you have a metal organic framework, here in this case, Dissecting this uh, 3D space into small cavities. That is, you, uh, you confine all these ion liquids in the mob force. Then uh, when you apply an uh, electric field, they will also move, but uh, they cannot actually form all these dedicated ion channels. In this case, uh, when they travel through the mob, the cations and ions have to share this mob force. Uh, uh, to, to get from one pole to the next one. So it is also e easy to imagine that if you have different number of ions in this uh, metal organic frameworks, the conductivity could be different. At least the mobility should be different. This is validated by both the experiment and molecular dynamic simulations. Here, the y-axis corresponds to the molar conductivity or uh, in other terms, the mobility of these ions uh, here, in this case, when you have a small number of ions, or what we call a low volume scenario of IL in the mob, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the, uh, conduct, uh, the mobility is generally high, but when you go for uh, more ions in, in this uh, system, the uh, mobility will drop. Uh, as you can see here, this y-axis is of log scale, so the, the uh, the drop of uh, mobility will be exponential. Then uh, what we have discovered from both cases uh, in the experiment and the simulation, that is uh, when the MOF is basically filled with all these ion liquids, there is a sudden drop, which indicates a, a critical transition in the, conduct, uh, in the conductivity. There you have basically no conductivity at all. That indicates all these ions are immobilized. So why is this happening? As you can see from this uh, animation, the gray thing corresponds to the moth, and uh, the red thing corresponds to the cations, and the, the blue thing is the anions. And uh, if we view this whole system from the side, as you can see on the left hand side, uh, all these uh, uh, and liquids will move, or they will be moved, driven by the external electric field. In the left case, uh, where there is low loading, all these things they will move, uh, they will form a homogeneous flow, so to speak. That uh, uh, statistically, the ion density stay the same across the whole system. 
But on the right hand side, you see just the formation of what we call a bunching layer. So the idea is that uh, the red uh, things uh, try to move to the, uh, uh, well, sorry, the red things, uh, the cations try to move to the right side and the uh, blue things, the anions try to move to the left side. But uh, since they uh, just obstruct each other's passage, they cannot go through. And uh, all of these ions will be compressing into a extremely dense layer, which is shown by this uh, density graph. And you form a biased distribution. That is, there is more uh, cations on the left side of this uh, bunching layer and the more anions on the right side of this bunching layer. Just to uh, make an extra note here, uh, they, these ions are basically uh, trapped on the wrong side of this bunching layer. And thus it makes it even harder to, to, to pass through. Uh, well, uh, if we take the analogy to our everyday traffic on the roads, people already had discussed about this actually. From a group of uh, Japanese uh, researchers, they had performed very funny experiments of uh, asking these volunteers to drive a, a infinite loop uh, with their vehicles. And then you see when there is, uh, let's say, a random slowing of all the traffic, it forms a shock wave of traffic congestion. And this shock wave will uh, diffuse uh, through a, a downstream uh, into the flow, uh, traffic flow that is following. And when you ask uh, the, the drivers to drive faster, this happens faster. Uh, and when there's more cars, as uh, we have every day, if there are more cars on the road, it is easier to form some, uh, somehow some traffic congestion so that there is a critical vehicle density that leads to certain traffic jams, even without a roadblock or, or uh, bottlenecking. Uh, area. But the one there is a roadblock, as uh, this German researcher had discovered, he recorded all the traffic flow on the uh, uh, German Autobahn, not far from here, not far from the Karlsruhe. This is uh, the uh, A5 traffic density, uh, just north of Frankfurt. There, uh, he basically divides uh, the uh, phases of the traffic flow into three. For these uh, green ones, that is uh, you drive uh, freely uh, on the highway without any obstruction. The general traffic density is low. Nobody's, uh, uh, well, is uh, stopping you. But when there's more traffic, the, the, there's now, now more cars on the roads, the drivers tend to drive uh, in a so-called synchronized flow. That is, even if everybody is driving slower, so the overall group density gets slower, it is still moving. Uh, so uh, everybody move at the same speed. But a, in the extreme case, when there is, is a certain roadblock, there's a sudden narrowing uh, in, the, uh, in the traffic, then uh, this congestion grows also towards downstream areas. So uh, he is calling this a wide moving jam. And uh, in everyday experience, we, we know this, is, this corresponds to uh, the uh, stop and go traffic that uh, you first uh, allow the, the, the drivers before you to move away and then you, you, you just follow them and then you uh, stop again and you spend a quite a lot of time here as suggested by this uh, almost flat slope in this uh, single car trajectory. Uh, you have to move very slowly throughout this whole traffic jam before you are released into another phase. Taking this as an inspiration, we also plot all these uh, traffic maps uh, of our eyes uh, in the morph. Here we also find three phases for the low loading scenario, 
the eye only uh, occupies 20% of the most all volumes. What you see here is a free traffic flow. Uh, this is uh, what resembles a, a so-called linear transport. Uh, but uh, when there are more ions inside, uh, you see uh, the red dots become small. That indicates uh, all these ions, they are moving slower. This uh, tower code corresponds to the instantaneous speed they are moving. And uh, from this uh, single ion trajectory painted as black, you see the linearity of all this uh, uh, trajectory gets worse. You have, uh, let's say, small plateaus here. That means along this time, from let's say 300 picoseconds to 400 picoseconds, you basically wait where you are, and then you wait for the concession to dissolve, and then you move onwards. And this is what we call a, a transient jamming. But in, in the extreme case where the ions actually fill the whole of the moth, what you see is a totally different pattern. You have all these uh, red layers. That means all these ions have to be kept there for extremely long times. All of these ions inside of these layers will be immobile. And if you follow one of these uh, typical tra trajectories here, maybe it's not that easy to see, unfortunately, uh, you, you spend a lot of time on a plateau in the layer before you escape. And uh, very briefly, you move very fast. That is indicated by these green dots. And then you hit one of these bunching layers again. Now we would compare uh, this kind of three-phase transport behavior to uh, uh, the uh, three-phase traffic theory that we say, OK, here we uh, review the uh, for formation of, let's say, uh, uh, this uh, uh, bunch of layer formation comes from uh, a homogeneous initial distribu distribution of all these ions. Also, the roadblocks uh, in these MOFs are also homogeneously distributed. And then the, and the third factor, you, you have a homogeneous external driving field. But then what you discover is that there is a spontaneous form formation of an inhomogeneous bunching layer. Uh, so the uh, conceptual um, Let's say picture will be looking like this. Uh, for the uh, positive charge carrier, they want to go to the left. For the negative charge carriers, will, uh, they want to go to the right. But they are confined by this uh, uh, moth pole. So they cannot get through. That's, there is a formation of this uh, inhomogeneous bunching layer. So if uh, uh, there is a certain bunching, for these uh, ions, be just because they have finite uh, sizes, this is mostly caused by these uh, van der Waals interactions. What about switching one of these ions higher uh, uh, to to a smaller ion? So let's uh, try to introduce one of these smallest ions in the periodic table. That is a vcm ion. We replace. Uh, uh, the SPM ion with 20% uh, lithium. And then we do the same uh, experiment. You can see here for the uh, uh, black data spots, they correspond to the uh, lithium doped and liquids inside of the moth. And the uh, uh, blue ones here will correspond to the pure SPM ion, TFSI, and liquids. Previously, we have the so-called bunching layer or this bunching transition, but here we don't have it anymore. But this is not as simple as it, as it looks from the conductivity, uh, conductivity data. We had, again, uh, performed all these molecular dynamic simulations. We see uh, we can derive from the empty data the componential contributions from all these three different components, the VCM, the BMI, and the, the, TFSI, the TFSI. And then we discovered 
there is a certain pattern that the VCM uh, contribution to the overall conductivity will generally increase when the voting of the ion liquids increase. This is uh, quite marvelous. And, and the, in the end, you still have the bunching of all these ions, but in the end, the VCM ion is still managing to, to get through this bunching layer. Thus, the overall conductivity is not as low as what you have for the pure and the viquous. Another point to make is that during this whole process, <clears throat> uh, uh, from the radar distribution function, you see that the uh, VCM ion is always found near another TFS, TFSI. This indicates a very strong ion pairing. That is the cation, the VCM is closely packed with the anion almost all the time. But uh, when you increase the overall ion loading, that is when you have more ions in the metal organic framework, this ion pairing becomes weaker. This indicates very strongly what we call a gratuitous spike popping. The Grotrus mechanism of proton uh, connection is already known uh, in, the, uh, in the field, in the literature. There, uh, basically in water for the proton connection, what you have is often uh, the uh, hydrogen will just uh, escape from the previous uh, water molecule, and then it's passed onwards in terms of uh, uh, in the form of um, a hydrogen bonding to the next water molecule that knocks the uh, uh, next hydrogen and, uh, and then this continues onwards. Uh, it, re it resembles an array of, let's say, people passing the water barrels to, uh, to, to, to work on some firefighting. And this gratuitous mechanism uh, contrasts vividly with uh, what we uh, saw earlier for the ion liquids, the vehicle of uh, vehicular transport. Again, uh, in the MD uh, trajectory, what you see here is again uh, for the low loading and the high loading. These uh, ion liquids will move in the same pattern as before. And uh, what you see is that uh, for this uh, vithium that are marked by these uh, orange balls, they are often kept stationary for a while near another TFSI before they hop onwards to, to, to pass on the electric conductivity. Uh, in the slow motion, as you see here, this is a certain uh, complex or a certain uh, pair of the VCM TFSI, TFSI, and uh, this recombination goes onwards all the time. From the density profile, you see again, the unliquids will stay in a homogeneous flow. For the low loading, for the high loading, the bunch of air also forms. But in the case of Vithium, they are so small, so they, they can navigate through this bunch of air. But it is not that a single eye just squeezes from here to there to there to pass at the, the overall electric conductivity but uh, one of these ions hit one spot, and then it dis destabilizes uh, the previous VCM TFSI complexes, and then releases another VCM ion, then passes it onwards. So uh, just within this bunch of area, there will be very short hops of a VCM, so that uh, one hits on the left side, it knocks uh, another VCM off from the right side. This is uh, what uh, we see exactly again in the single ion trajectories. We compare the uh, single ion trajectories of VCM ion on the right with uh, uh, um, the tracer ion trajectories uh, of BM ion. For the BM ion cation, this is a old story we saw earlier. But for the VCM, you can see here, they always go in these uh, stepwise hoppings. Uh, in some cases, they wait longer time before uh, it continues onwards. But uh, when the overall ion loading gets increased, 
there are more ions in the morph. That means uh, the overall environment gets more homogeneous. So you have more of these uh, preferential pockets, uh, lithium can stay inside. So this uh, hopping transport, uh, well, the waiting time for this hopping transport gets even decreased. So that's why you have a, a increased uh, VCM contribution in the overall conductivity. And when uh, the MOF is totally filled with all these ion liquids, as you see here, the BIMIM stay in the bunching layer for extremely long times. And you see the formation of these uh, bunching layers <coughs> indicated by these uh, uh, red horizontal plateaus. Here for the VCM, it is not actually the case. Uh, it still follows these uh, short hops to actually navigate through this bunching layer. And uh, you don't see the layer uh, formation for this VCM tra tra trajectory. Then the conceptual picture will be working like this. This is some kind of a toy that we are familiar with that we put on the table. If you uh, have one of these metal balls raised and then uh, release it, the momentum will be passed through all the way, but uh, uh, this, uh, the displacement, uh, displacements of these uh, single metal balls will not be uh, that far. So uh, with these uh, small hops, the VCM manages to get through the bunching layer of all these molecular and the liquids. Then uh, we can modify the composition of the and liquids. What happens if we uh, make changes on the MOF side? There is a special family of MOFs that are, uh, are of a special interest, that is the UIO family MOFs. Compared to the previous MOF of H plus one, the power volumes of all these UIO MOFs can be uh, changed incrementally. And for these fingers, you can have one aromatic grain, two aromatic grains, and uh, three aromatic grains. To make, uh, to make a UIO 66, 67, or 68. And in some cases, there's also a so-called UIO 66.5. That is, you have two of these aromatic rings, but they are not uh, uh, linked uh, like a, a linear V, but they, they overlap a little bit to make the pore smaller than uh, UIO 67, but uh, larger than UIO 66. If we have different pore volumes, then we have different pore apertures, that is uh, uh, also the pore openings will be different. Then we see both from the, uh, consistently from the experiment and simulations, we get the more or less uh, the correct behaviors from the simulations. Then we see here uh, for the large pore URL MOFs, the bunching is basically uh, absent. For the small pore UIOs, there is a certain bunching, but this bunching transition becomes much milder. And also arguably all these uh, critical IO densities that uh, infect all these bunching transitions, they will be also different. Let's say from here to here to here to basically none. If we don't plot all these contact, uh, conductivity curves uh, with, with respect to uh, and liquid, uh, liquid loadings, but against all these more pore apertures, we see a distinct a threshold value where all of a sudden you don't have bunching anymore. And uh, this exact point here, around 0.8 nanometers, is uh, what we find uh, exactly around the, the uh, Palavar size of a pair of these ion liquids, that is the uh, anion plus the cation uh, combined. The, the so-called dimer will be around uh, the size of uh, 0.8 nanometers. Um, well, another uh, sp special feature that we find is that, uh, uh, as you can see already, uh, from all these uh, movies, when you switch on the electric field. For the uh, small pore UIOs, the bunching is everywhere. So nothing effectively removes. You have to wait a very long time for the tracer ion to hop from one uh, of these uh, unit cell to the next one. For the large pore UIOs, 
everything goes relatively freely. Sometimes more uh, traveling along this side. Uh, in other cases, some traveling uh, faster uh, on the horizontal side. But uh, specific, uh, specifically for this UIO67, because uh, the uh, UIO moths are grown on the substrate in the 111 direction, the uh, electric field must be uh, a normal against this 11 direction. So it has to be in this 110 direction. But uh, for the movements of, uh, of this eye is to hop from one part to the next one, it, it must zigzag uh, for a small segment in this uh, one zero zero direction, for instance, go up and then go right to, to reach the next pole. But for UIO67, this is not the case. We see that in this animation that uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, one, 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 uh, one zero zero direction is completely blocked. But in the zero one, uh, zero one zero direction, everything moves relatively freely. If we run a series of different simulations, we see this is exactly the case. There is 50 50 chance that one of these poles, uh, pole channels, either in the one 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 uh, one zero zero direction or zero one zero direction, gets blocked, whereas the orthogonal pole channel remains free. So to uh, summarize for the URO family morphs, uh, as you can see in these snapshots for the small pole UROs, uh, the pole size is not enough uh, to allow simultaneous passage of a cation and an anion. So they have to go one step at a time. So everywhere you have this bunching for uh, high voting and uh, for low voting, everything is going very slowly. But for the medium pole and large pole UIOs, uh, you have basically linear transport. When you have a, a low loading for the aliquids, but uh, for the high loading case, this uh, specific pole structure that is, uh, you may imagine if you enter from this side into uh, this pole, you have to choose whether to go left uh, or go left or go right. So that this uh, special all channel alignment uh, will result in this so-called bifurcation that we see also in the single iron trajectories. And uh, so all, all these cases, uh, we have a basic guideline that uh, how these all apertures should be to actually totally avoid this bunching. That is the, the minimum pole size that you should have and then uh, what if we uh, exchange these anaviquous with larger uh, counterparts? Let's say the anaviquous will have a longer tail, et cetera, to, to make everything larger then for the, uh, to, to avoid bunching, we should choose an even larger pore volume or pore opening for the metal organic framework. Well, to summarize, uh, to put all these anaviquous uh, inside of the metal organic framework, especially the thermals, will give you a highly tunable solid state electrolyte. And uh, there is a, a special feature uh, that is what we call a bunching. If you load so many ions inside, there is a certain chance of uh, making a, a double layer uh, or what we call a bunching layer that is probably useful for a supercapacitor, but then the electric conductive, uh, conductivity is extremely low after the bunching transition. There are certain ways to avoid such bunching. You can either introduce a small ions, which follows all these uh, grotto spike hopping patterns. And then uh, you can also modify the more pore structure to make uh, the pore larger systematically or to have a different uh, pole alignments. For instance, for instance, from one pole to the next one, there could be three ways or there could be four ways. In that case, you have different uh, patterns for the uh, ion bifurcation or uh, there could be uh, uh, more, say, flow structures that you can design. Uh, so to conclude, I would, like to thank all the collaborators from the Institute of Functional Interfaces, which are 
working mostly on the uh, experiments and uh, all these uh, topics at INT, which work on the molecular dynamic simulations and all these funding parties, as well as the uh, HPC resources. Uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, I uh, expect uh, questions now. Okay, so uh, thanks for that for very uh, interesting talk and uh, very detailed uh, about the MOF and the the iron transport in the MOF. So any question from our audience? Uh, I saw panel with his hand. Panel, you have a question? I don't have one right now. I basically clapped hands. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot for the talk, yeah. So I have a question about the uh, the metal a porous metal uh, framework. I'm not sure how you can create this uh, this uh, connected and porous network inside the, the metal uh, material. Uh, in experiment, in a simulation is very easy to to generate this uh, morphology. But uh, in experiment, how how you can generate this kind of uh, material? Well, uh, uh, as far as I know, in the uh, experiment, you can either have a mop powder. Uh, this can be done by uh, just throwing everything, uh, like the metal, uh, metal nodes and the organic vinegars uh, into, a, into a pot and cook it with a special technique. And then in the end, you have uh, all these uh, small crystals, but the environment is not as well as uh, working as well as the thermops. The thermos, you have a special layer by layer technique. That is, uh, all these uh, experimental, experimentalists, they use a, a small robot. Actually, uh, to uh, first, you have the substrate, and uh, there are some functional groups on the substrate. First, you fix all these metal nodes in a, 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 a grid like structure. And then, uh, for the next step, uh, you uh, insert only the vincus. Then you raise everything away so that you have a, let's say, half a layer of the moth. And then you throw in the metal nodes again. This, is, this time is uh, exclusively the metal nodes. And these metal nodes will find themselves on top of these fingers. And then you go for the next layer. So uh, deposit, rains, deposit, rains, and layer by layer, you grow a very well defined crystalline structure. Okay, yes. okay. So it's kind of similar to the 3D printing process. <laughs> yeah, kind of, uh, uh, right. But uh, this uh, small unit cell can be really small because uh, the vinca can be short uh, for the 3D printing. Maybe you have a uh, limiting resolution of let's say uh, 100 nanometers, but uh, for, for these uh, small pores, you have around let's say, two nanometers. So, the uh, uh, scale different is that. Okay, okay. Uh, and another question about the, uh, in, in, in the uh, slice uh, five, you can go to the... Yeah. Yeah, the, the, you, you, you uh, should the experiment the data about the, the conductivity of, uh, at the different ionic liquid thinning. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm not sure why why this is uh, this is um, um, monotonic decreasing because if you consider the the ionic uh, liquid density it's uh, it's very low. Um, actually, the, the the density the you you can have free free flow right, but yep. the, the because of the density it's uh, it's it's lower so. I'm not sure why. Why you you if you increase the density, at some point you should reach some peak. I expect you should reach some peak and then decrease because of the the, the you lose the um, mobility at the okay. later later thinning. But I, I see this is uh, decreasing as it's monoton um, monotonically decreasing as uh, as the ionic liquid thinning. I'm not sure. Uh, why well, uh, we there is a small catch here. Uh, so uh, on the y-axis, what you read is molar conductivity, 
So yeah. this basically means this is about mobility. And if you want the overall conductivity, you will have to multiply this data point by what you have on the X axis. So okay. you have to multiply mobility with uh, the, uh, the, the number of eyes you have. So in the end, you have a curve that looks like this. There is okay. a saturation okay. and uh, then there will be a, a decrease again. Okay, it makes sense. So another thing is you, you are trying to transport the, the ions through the, um, the, the porous network. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering because you are using the, the, the framework is made by metal, right? Yeah. Does this also so generate current through the, the metal mater material? Well, uh, I, uh, uh, if you see here for the H plus one, for instance, all these metals are here. So this is one copper, this is another copper. So they always come in a copper copper pairs. But uh, as far as I know, there's so much symmetry that, and they are, uh, uh, let's say, so placed so far apart that there can be no electron transfer through this whole uh, thing. But uh, if you, you add a 660 inside, they can be, uh, there can be conductivity. Uh, if you allow uh, these, uh, uh, these bands to overlap somehow. And this is more of the DFT simulations or DFT calculations rather than uh, MD uh, simulations. Uh, okay, actually, actually in the framework, the metal uh, part is isolated in the framework, right? So yeah, they... exactly, yeah. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Oh, hi, Modan. <laughs> this is Zhao Yan from University of Buffalo. So thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So in fact, I just have two questions. Uh, so the first one is about the, uh, so currently I can see that all your results are based on the like a static electric field, right? So uh, say if you want, you can change the static electric field to the alternating like a current like field, AC field. So will that be possible to help a uh, kind of open some kind of uh, 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 part of the like uh, so-called bunching area that you observed from your simulation? Yeah, definitely if you uh, just uh, swap the direction of the uh, electric field, then this bunch of field will basically dissolve. Um, and from the, sim uh, sorry, from the experiment setup, you see that they are using an AC current. So that's one way to actually avoid all this ion accumulation near the electrodes. And, uh, uh, and, and also this uh, uh, formation and the dissolution of this bunch of air is also what they have in the experiments. But uh, for the molecular dynamic simulations, we are using a three by three by three amorphous unit cell, which is extremely small. It's only like uh, eight nanometers uh, in each dimension. So uh, using an AC field here is not so practical to speak, oh, but okay. uh, 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 if we, uh, yes, we, we did uh, run the uh, MD simulation, uh, let's say, uh, if we first obtain this bunch of air and then we uh, just uh, swap the uh, uh, direction of the electric field, then, then definitely we see this uh, dissolution of the bunch of air. I see, I see. And my second question, in fact, is more about the molecular dynamics. Uh, so uh, for your current system, what kind of potential do you use? Uh, for like the liquid ion system and also your morph system? And okay, also so uh, uh, for, the, uh, um, uh, for the morph, we use basically UF F for morph, universal force field for metal organic frameworks. Um, this is not ideal for dynamics, it's more for modeling, but uh, we found it to be actually useful. And uh, another plus side is that this UF for morph is compatible with all these uh, open LS uh, based uh, uh, phosphors for the ion liquids. And uh, in the ion liquids field, um, people usually use uh, open LS directly, or they use uh, their, uh, let's say, a DFT derived phosphor, which is pretty similar to the open LS AA phosphor. So, yeah, we just uh, take the parameters from uh, both. Uh, Phosphors and then mix them together. I see, I see. So in your simulation, you do allow the like the motion of your morph framework, right? To 
Uh, well, uh, not necessarily. Uh, we can uh, since the Morpheus charge neutral when we apply the electric field, it doesn't move. But uh, since the unequivalence will move, and also you may find that uh, for uh, this BIMI, uh, for instance, this is more hydrodynamically favorable compared to the NTF2 because uh, this is a wedge shape. It's really rigid. This has a small tail and effect, uh, sorry, a small head uh, and a flexible tail. So the BMI will generally move faster and this will just squeeze the, uh, the metal organic framework to be moving uh, towards one side, but uh, we can always rebind everything with respect to the, uh, let's say the CU atoms in the metal organic framework. So that uh, if we do this, uh, we realignment continuously, the morph is not effectively moving. Okay, thank you so much. So any other question from our audience? Okay, if not, then we will end at this seminar uh, here. And if you have additional questions, you can con contact uh, Dr. Neil directly. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot.